I'm Margaret Miller. I'm the director of the Institute for Research in Art, which includes the Contemporary Art Museum, Graphic Studio, and the Public Art Program. And I'm just thrilled to see so many of you here this morning. Uh, this is the beginning of the school year and a wonderful time to be opening a new show. And uh, the symposium is a very critical element of the exhibition. So I appreciate you all being here. For more than a decade, the USF Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio have cultivated a rich and lasting connections with, the Cuban, art, with Cuban art and artists. Uh, this has started several years, and we've had artists come up and work at Graphic Studio. Uh, Noel Smith has been down many times to uh, promote and cultivate this relationship, so we're very proud of it. Because of the limitless ma imagination and ambition, the influence of these artists extends far beyond the Caribbean island's shores. Though Cuba is a tiny nation compared to some, the appreciation of the prolific output of its artists is critical to any understanding of contemporary art in a global context. Certainly, Carlos Garacoa, one of the most internationally recognized of a generation of Cuban artists, born in the 1960s, would figure prominently in any account of Cuban art, but also of contemporary art in general. A native of Havana, uh, uh, Carlos takes the city as a starting point for explorations of social and political issues, human rights, the role of architecture in forming civic consciousness, and the frustrations of utopian dreams that have global, uh, global resonance and relevance. The work in this exhibition is at once particular to Cuba and universal. The exhibition Carlos Garacoa, Making Amends, debuted, uh, opened first at the Havana Biennial in 2009 at Havana's National Museum of Fine Arts. This is the museum with Chief Curator Corina Matamoros, who we have had such a long and fruitful relationship. Uh, Karina curated the show there. The USF Contemporary Art Mu Museum maintains a unique and cordial relationship with this Cuban institution as well as many others um, on the island. Uh, Karina and Noel Smith have uh, curated many shows together. Noel has lots of titles, which I'll give you in a moment, but she is uh, probably the one she's most fond of is curator of Latin American and Caribbean art. The bilingual nature of this exhibition and its references to Cuba's urban realities, politics, and history present a challenge to an American audience unfamiliar with contemporary Cuba. The extensive printed labels and audio recordings that accompany the exhibition are designed to help viewers bridge this cultural divide. To complement the interdisciplinary nature of Garacoa's work, faculty members throughout the University of South Florida have contributed their knowledge and expertise. These, uh, some of these faculty and uh, leaders include uh, Rachel May, Associate Professor and, and Director of the Institute for the Study of Latin American and Caribbean, uh, for the Study of Latin American and Caribbean. Linda Whiteford, okay, Linda Whiteford has the world's longest title. Uh, Linda Whiteford, who's here today, uh, two rows back, sitting next to Alexa, has just been an important um, member of the central administration for us in helping us move forward with many of our programs. So she's, uh, Linda's a, pro a professor of anthropology and her title at the moment is Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs and Strategic Initiatives. How about that? And she's in the office of the provost. And Paul Dorsal, a professor of Latin American history and the director of student success uh, also in the office of the provost. We thank Mark Weston, uh, who you will meet in a moment. He's back there, he's associate professor in the School of Architecture, and he is going to be one of our participants in the symposium, so Noel will introduce him more fully in a moment. Um, for the first time, uh, the Contemporary Art Museum has undertaken the production of a, second, uh, a secondary education curriculum called Inside Art an online program designed to expose middle school age uh, children to contemporary art. Um, Carlos Garacoa's uh, work serves as the focus of the first curriculum, an endeavor we plan to repeat in the future. We got a nice grant from the National Endowment for the Arts to support this initiative. 
Professor Barbara Cruz in the College of Education led this project. Uh, the, oh, I guess it was a, the Florida Division of Cultural Affairs that funded it, not the NEA. Though that was even more remarkable. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tord uh, Stalvik of the Stalvik Art and Education <laughs> Fund who uh, generously supported this project. The ambition and scope of this project, the catalog, the interpretive programming, are all possible because of the talent and dedication of the faculty and staff of the Institute for Research and Art, the Contemporary Art Museum and Graphic Studio. I want you to know some of these people. It just can't happen without this amazing team that we have at the Institute. Uh, I want to thank Associate Director Alexa Favada for coordinating it all. She and I have worked together for decades, and it, it really is a, a wonderful relationship. Uh, Don Fuller did all of the design of the publications related to the exhibition and still is going to work on the catalog. He also designs the website, and he uh, told me that the recording today uh, that we're making of this symposium, along with all of our other uh, symposia videos and technique uh, videos, is all up on IRA I, uh, YouTube. We're good. Is that right? IRA YouTube, where's Don? USFIRA, there we go. Uh, curator of the collections, Peter Foe, along with Registrar Shannon Annis, have helped with many of the loans, the exhibition, and I think you'll see tonight, it's just a, a beautiful design, was uh, worked on by uh, several people, but under the leadership of uh, Tony Palms and Chief Preparator Vincent Crawl. And I always want to thank our Chief of Security, Dave Waterman, who is the security chief glorious uh, guy who um, understands the exhibitions in our programming and does so much to introduce the students to our program. Um, the exhibition uh, installation crew included Tony Billick, Wesley Roos, Erica Jonas, Drew Ahern, and Tom McGee, all students. Our business quarter coordinator, Randy West, we can't do anything without him, so we always have to acknowledge him. And uh, our Director of Sales and Marketing, Kristen Sodequist, uh, helped a great deal with a lot of the uh, social networking for this project, and she worked closely with Jennifer Andrews. And I want to also thank um, Amy Allison for coordinating all of the events associated with this. Now, I mentioned a moment ago that one of the things we tried was to do something extraordinary and new with the educational uh, aspect of this exhibition, particularly with the writing of the labels. And I want to ag acknowledge Megan Voller, an art history graduate student, for her help uh, in writing the labels over the summer. Uh, Justin uh, Weeks is also acknowledged for his work. Thanks to the USF Cuban American Student Association for its co-sponsorship of the exhibition symposium today. The USF Institute for the Study of Latin American Caribbean Art also contributed support for this event. Havana's National Museum of Fine Arts staff was most helpful in bringing this exhibition to Tampa. And I thank Morima um, Colon, the director of the National Museum of Fine Arts, for lending us Karina and supporting all of our exchanges. From the studio of Carlos Garacoa in Havana, uh, Lilbit. Fadraga was uh, involved in every aspect of the project and came a week before the show opened and uh, helped with the installation. I also want to acknowledge my Marti. Uh, she is the uh, wife of Carlos uh, and she is a clarinetist with the R National Symphony of Cuba and talked with our School of Music students yesterday. And she is intimately connected with the studio and the development of projects for Carlos. So we are delighted that she's here, too. It, the Contemporary Art Museum is part of the College of the Arts. And Dean Ron Jones continues in these very difficult times to support the programs of the museum. The Florida Division of Cultural Affairs and the Stalvik Education and Art Foundation in, in New York are acknowledged for their support of the exhibition and of Inside Art. And my appreciation goes to Heather and Tony Podesta in Washington for the loan of the Crown Jewels installation. Finally, I want to thank Carlos Garacoa for all of his assistance in making this exhibition possible here, for your generosity, and for the amazingly beautiful work he's doing at Graphic Studio. So you have to come over and see those projects in process. 
uh, and thank you uh, for participating today in this symposium and offering our students and our community so much. So with that, it's now I'm going to introduce you to uh, Noelle Smith, who will introduce the panelists today. As I mentioned, Noelle Smith is curator of Latin American and Caribbean art and the curator of education, and she also directs the Museum Studies Graduate Certificate Program. So you can see she keeps very busy. She has an extensive record of working with artists and writers from Cuba and Latin America and has organized exhibitions of graphic studio works in Colombia and Mexico. She has co-curated three exhibitions for the USF CAM with Karina Matamoros, including Los Carpinteros, Embedding the World, Homing Devices, and they are currently working together on an exhibition of graphic studio works that will go down to Cuba to the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana in October 2011. She holds an MA in art history from USF. She teaches and lectures widely in the region and is a literary translator. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you to Noelle Smith, who will take over today. Margaret, none of this would happen without you, so my sincere appreciation and thanks to you. Um, I just wanted to say a short word that um, appreciation to Carlos and to the National Museum and to everyone who has been connected with this exhibition. It's a truly international effort um, on all levels. It really means a lot to me to see you here today. And I thank you so much for your collaboration and interest and support. About two years ago, well, we've been trying to get Carlos here for a while. But a couple of years ago, um, I got an email from Carlos and from Corina, and they said, we're doing this great exhibition for the 10th Havana Biennale. Do you think USF would be interested in having it? And I was like, well, yeah, I'd love to have it. <laughs> so uh, two years later, with visas and having to send work from from Havana to Toronto to Tampa and all the types of political and um, problems that we've had with this, we have this beautiful, beautiful exhibition here today. So briefly, let me tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce Corina. Corina is going to give a um, talk uh, about Carlos's work and about the exhibition. And then I'll introduce Carlos, who will speak. Um, briefly about his work, um, and then um, Mark Weston will respond, and then we will have perhaps some conversation among us, and we'll open the floor for questions. Um, so Corina Matamoros is Curator of Contemporary Cuban Art at the National Museum of Fine Arts in Havana. She has a degree in art history from the School of Philology, uh, University of Havana, and a degree in museum studies from the Louvre in Paris. During her 32-year tenure at the National Museum of Fine Arts, she has been responsible for building the collection of contemporary Cuban art and has organized many exhibitions of contemporary Cuban art. She's an international member of our own board here at the IRA. Um, most recently, she published a volume of her collected essays called Mirada de Curador, the, the Curator's Gaze. And this summer, she curated the first American exhibition of the seminal Cuban pop artist Raul Martinez, which was shown at the Magnum Metz Gallery in New York. And Sunday, she goes to the Vermont Studio Workshop, where she's working on a book on Raul Martinez. Please welcome Corina Matamoros. Thanks, Margaret Millet and Noel Smith, and the authorities of the university for inviting me and for host this wonderful exhibition. Preliminary draft. There I go to cough with the 90s. He belongs to that generation which emerged during the special period the harsh economic crisis of revolutionary Cuba. 
It was one of those moments that was ideal for not producing art, but when really good art was produced nevertheless. At the same time emerged Casho, Los Carpinteros, Tania Bruguera, Abel Barroso, Sandra Ramos, Jose Toirac, and an impressive group of today's well-established names. At first, the photograph of Garaycoa's public street intervention, traffic signs, decoys, possessed a subtle provoking spirit. They seemed to protest the loss of an aesthetic and maybe an ethic amidst the abandonment of the illustrious city of Havana. Photography became the mute evidence of a body of building society and individuals vividly sense among the ruined buildings. Later, Garaiko assumed the task of creating replicas of built details and even architectural installation and in their absolute and amazing fidelity, better concealed his contempt. At that point, Garaiko showed signs of discouragement and his attention slowly moved toward the possible. He then began drafting utopian architecture that gained him a following, in which he reconstructed ruined buildings with ingenious, impossible solutions. Other cities began to call him, above all New York, St. Havana's sister city. Others will come later. His cities began to move away from their reference and crafted from paper rises illuminate waitles. A growing inclination led him to make new architectures, to draw over the photograph with thread, to discover almost with amazement the urban billboards and their influence over the city. Urban planning. Seen from a holistic perspective, all of Carlos Garagoa's work deals with politics. His media is so, are so heterogeneous, so hybrid, so distant from one another at moments that the whole can only be seen through a highly strategic vision. Aesthetic preference become political when the conventional limits that distinguish art from not art are crossed. And Garagoa includes everything that serves his ideas, regardless of the genealogy and tradition to which his visual, symbolic, and physical repertories belong. This related directly to another of his peculiarities, the difficult of dealing with his work, specifically piece by piece. First of all, the analysis of single works is unsatisfactory when left wanting in attempting to taste out an elusive narrative. And second, an isolated reading is not enough to explain the true meaning of his project. Only knowing the totality of his work, or at least group of his work, can Garagoa's art be explained. His pieces are like words, in need of the text's global syntax in order to be interpreted. His art practice is an oper operating system that seems, to be, that seems to progressively devour certain types of image, knowledge, and actual experience, incorporating them with rapid sensibility and a great sense of timing. This heterogeneity can only be maintained over time by a perpetual cognitive avidity. In Garaycoa, this avidity seems to be directed towards fields that neighbor the visual arts, literature, sociology, music, architecture. The city has been the great pretext for his poetics. What can be more heterogeneous than a city? What other source will provide more material? 
Quad will furnish more alternatives. Born and raised in the middle of a beautiful and neglected historical city, it was logical that he would value the magnificence of its buildings and that he would encounter many places that still preserve their vestigial charm, a seduction brushed with the mystery of Austin. But choosing architecture is choosing the habitat and his circumstances, the people immersed in their life, the community and its symbols. The choice is, if not the total human environment, at least the nature created by humankind where ordinary people live. The White Avenues. The city itself, unique to human creation, the scene of many comforts and conflicts continuously offers the artist more and more motive for reflection. Could be a coincidence that in the midst of the current war economic crisis, Garagoa makes a model out of coin of iconic European buildings as he did in Portrait of Europe? Or can we believe that the magnificent work, The Hunter, where a man drags a hut made of mirror around the city, is not related to the dilemma of the displaced? Or that his installation, I don't want to see my neighbors anymore, does not allude to the incompatible difference, the violence, the violence and hate of all kinds generate in our world, or that the, that the surprising campus does not talk about the society of violence, or that the analysis of a historical situation as in the reconstruction of the Dutch city of Arhen in Now Let's Play to Disappear, made with candles that continuously burn down cannot teach us something useful about today's world, or that the monumental letter, letter to the censors does not insist in the right to say what we think. All of these great works are contemporary political statements. Urban foraging. Not everything in the city is a white avenue. Caraco also has his dead ends and alleys, noisy and hidden neighborhoods. His home is within the great city. That is, he lives within the object of his work. And like any good flaneur, I don't know what happened here. There is done. <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> he's unlike any good flaneur, he always finds many interesting scenes in the urban landscape. He wanders into literature, completing the phrases he finds on all business signs of if you were composing a street haiku. The artist can never ignore the text. His endless search on the building facade turns the city into a book which offers itself a, to pedestrian a poem written while walking. Architectural project. And what if the artist's long voyage was just a road to architecture? What if his dissatisfaction with the media of expression, the unorthodox resource, utopia as preamble, and a sculpture as an essay were only hiding the true goal of someone who is building a space for life itself. Starting with pieces like Campus, Garagoa begins working in buildable architectures, designing and planning in collaboration with a group of architects and maquette builders. The artist's studio became a team in a style of an architect's office, and it takes a road that anticipates actual construction. 
In fact, he and his team have been working on a project for a public library in Castleford, a small English mining town. The site will host an astronomical observatory, an exhibit of Roman ruins found underground, and the library itself. The artist's new project may be grand architectural works, the kinds created as ideas before being built. Those require more than the, any other art all knowledge and all human creativity. The city's complexity demands all skills. Architecture will claim from the artist renewal, obligation, bigger solution, and supreme, supreme inventiveness. On the table where the political world is transformed into fact. The world table had become a miniature city. Things change their scale there but the logic is reproduced with amazing accuracy. This is a Norwalk city, influenced by the billboards, buildings, and advertising we find everywhere. The artist has included all kinds of material, cutie marks, light boxes, building models. There, there is something liberating about a table where we can add or remove artifacts, making it flow with our thoughts. It is a table with common city objects are used in order to insert other signs to leave new marks or to propose personal statements. On the mat, one can read phrases like make an amend, Negation in my blood. Starry night. There are two billboards facing each other that read, I believe in everything on one side and I believe nothing on the other. Let us imagine that we wander in, the, in this part of the city and that those billboards suddenly confront us obviously leaving us thinking. Let us imagine that the billboard that was always in the corner of Linea and Day Street in Havana, just by the bus stop, has sprouted a lookalike building in the same place where before there was only a sign to read. The billboards have become a major focus of the artist's attention, giving him rich political fodder. These advertising media gather in the single physical entity, the literacy of a text, the ideology of a message, and the visual presence of a symbol. Many billboards have turned mute in recent years, emptied by neglect or lack of material. Those former bearers of national political life still retain their metallic skeleton clinging from roof and roadsides. Silent and enigmatic, they scream an absence that the artist listens to with care. There he plays his new message. There may be other silent billboards designed for existing place in the city or architectural project. But whether using thread drawings or digital modeling over photographs seen, Garicoa continues an urban billboard project that is important in the language of the revolution, proposing to add a concrete building to, a, to an, an abandoned billboard is nothing less than passing from the political world to the action. So, it is not about the sketches for utopias, as commonly known, but about building a true wall against chimerical excesses, proposing a real path for action. Architecture as symbol, the 18th Brumaire of Carlos Garicoa. Because he, was, he has completed a long voyage that began by analyzing a city system of symbols because he made drawings for constructed utopias. 
because he has gone through hyperrealism and through never before seen or living in urban utopia, utopias, and because he has, he has experienced the intense passion of designing a social space for real use that I go at least to architecture as a symbol. Everything that happened to humans take place in a specific landscape. The subject of his work is taking that space as the metonymy of the conflict of contemporary civilization. For example, in theory and practice of the 18 Brumaire, he investigated the state of a certain architecture practiced in revolutionary Cuba. And he does it by forcefully interpreting reality, as did Karl Marx in his book, The 18 Brumaire of Louis Bonaparte, with his spectacular examination of the revolutions he observed in the mid of the 19th century. Using numerous volumes of the historical text, Garagoa constructs an apartment building in a ruinous state, a type commonly known in Cuba as 12th floor. The act of using one of the Karl Marx Sound's essay to construct a building that in no way can equal the text, either in function or in scope, creates a relentless look at the unfortunate socio-constructive circumstances of the island. Modeling silver miniature of well-known buildings is another singular way the artist deals with architecture. Like Ewell's carefully stored in vitrines, the artist offers to the public spectacular gems that, with their magnificent craft, material beauty, and surprising appearance, are luxury items. With them, Garagoa betrays us. Following Michel Foucault's ideas about places of repression, the artist has taken certain buildings as a model that symbolize in the public imagination, torture, violence, surveillance, and military control. All of the feelings of wonder and pleasure that the splendid silver work, works awaken slowly turn on, on intellectual, intellectual consternation. The, the crown jewels is a work with a specific tempo. The viewer, dazzled by beauty of the Eton, begins to read a little too late the description printed on the labels that accompany each piece in, the, in its glass sanctuary. The viewer will recognize, for example, in that beautiful elliptical shape, the National Stadium of Chile, and possibly will remember that tragic history in 1973 when the military dictatorship converted the site into a concentration and death camp for thousands of Chileans. Other jewels are the Navy School or Mechanic in Argentina, an intelligence, counterintelligence, military sites in Moscow, Havana, Washington, or Germany. Once again, the artist plants decoys in his work and seems to ask us which symbol of surveillance, aggression, or tyranny we will take home for the value of the silver. How far are we willing to involve ourselves in the intricacy of power? How have the prerogative of power historica, historically influ influenced architectural expression. Garicoa maintains a penetrating 18 Brumaire attitude about everything that happens around him, a particular wisdom towards everything that occurs in the universe of the city. After all, it was the grand design of the city which inspired him sociological vision. 
what awoke in him utopias and philosophical reflection, what demanded to be read as a text, what has induced him to simulate it and to amend it, what has challenged him to add new buildings, what has served him finally as the material, the methodology, and the stage for all of humanity. Thanks very much. Garacoa. Don is setting up. Carlos will have a um, kind of, con oh, he's done it already, a kind of looping, um, uh, looping slideshow of his work um, during his talk here. Um, you've heard now a lot of very insightful and poetic commentary from Karina about Carlos. I'll introduce him a little bit more practically. Carlos Garacoa Manso was born in Havana, Cuba in 1967, and he lives and works between Havana and Madrid. He has studios in both places. Carlos studied thermodynamics um, in Cuba before later going to study art at the Instituto Superior de Arte, the Superior Institute of Art in Havana. He employs, as you saw, a multidisciplinary approach um, with his chief subject being the city of Havana. His installation works, as you will see, particularly in our exhibition, include installation, video, photography, sculpture, pop-up books, and drawing. Um, Carlos most recently had a solo exhibition at the Irish Museum of Modern Art in Dublin, and also an exhibition at the um, Museum in Medellin, Colombia. He has been part of solo and group exhibitions, more than I could say here, but for example, at MOCA in Los Angeles, the ICA in Philadelphia, the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, the Maison Européenne de la Photographie in Paris, Palazzo de la Papesse in Siena, as well as the Havana, Venice, Liverpool, Sao Paulo, Yokohama, Johannesburg, and Guangzhou Biennials. At the moment, he's working in a building project called the Observatory, supported by the City of Castleford and the Arts Council of United Kingdom. We're so happy to have you here, Carlos. Please come up. to say after Corina and Noel and uh, can I stop this you see if I do this I stop yeah okay stop <laughs> oh, um, anyway uh, it's a pleasure to be here at the USF and uh, very good to work with graphic studio uh, it's a been a long journey to do this exhibition and uh, actually to, to be back to the United States with my exhibition. I've been doing a lot in, in like a decade or something, no? A decade, ten, 10 years or more. And uh, yeah, many things happened here until the 2004, 2005. I've been doing a lot of exhibitions in MOCA, ICA in Philadelphia at the MoMA, in Aspen, et cetera, that was really accomplished, accomplished? Like a, a, a career that been built a lot based in, the, in America, relation between Cuba and America, was really a good moment in the 90s when we flew here and been living almost in New York and study here and have a lot of grant, et cetera. But uh, being a long trip to really come back with a new exhibition and uh, I don't say this, all the details that we were talking yesterday about how difficult been uh, travel here and all the visas problems and how we've been denied to enter the country, etc. 
but uh, you know, I think it's a new model, and um, uh, I I will try to be sure. But uh, uh, basically, I feel like a big responsibility, or my work have a big responsibility because everyone say that my work is full of sociology, is full of politics, full of uh, uh, social engagement. And uh, I wanted to say as well that I love a lot design. I, I, am, I love the design and I love drawing and I love uh, the fact of uh, creating a lot of aircraft scenes. I think my part of, big part of my work as well is based in this. I think the, the 90s, and eight, the end of the 80s and 90s in Cuba was a very particular moment when we really uh, switched from the very uh, sociological environment in the 80s. It's a long history that probably you can read a little bit more in, in text, etc. But really was a moment in the 80s when artists really, um, I think, redefined language, uh, visual art in Cuba. We really, for the first time inside the revolution, we really start to think about another medium of doing art, not only art is a being as an object of as a painting or as a sculpture, etc., we really we have to say that we discover uh, happening. We discover uh, social engagement through art, and we really have this political background. I think one of the Cuba explore more is uh, politics, and uh, it's uh, it's terrible. We arrive to everywhere, and everyone asks us about the destiny of the country, etc., and we have to be experts. You know, we have to have answer for that. Sometimes you don't even want to, to talk about that. You want to have a drink and have a party like everyone, but you have to have the future in front of you. And then for that reason as well, I think we really, coming from this very deep school, like a, or work in a certain way, have to be related socially. And we have all this training and this pushing of a, a, the work have to have answers to society in certain ways. And uh, probably that's part of the reason uh, that I grew up with these ideas in mind as well. And probably for that, um, the reason that I love so much literature and writers, that I feel like uh, you need a commitment beyond to be sitting in the studio and producing things. And all this really bring me in the 90s for the, you know, early 90s, we really been looking for this sociological engagement in the work. So many artists have been doing that in Havana. And the new situation that we've been facing in the 90s, how to really enter a market. That's something was very discussed in, the, in Cuba in the 90s when after the big crisis we have uh, 91 to 93 or something like that, we've really been, and the open of the money in Cuba, we don't even can we was not allowed to have dollars in the pocket. We have to live with a very particular way. And I think from all this arrive a new society that we've been sharing in the last 15 years, 20 years. It's really a society like it's a mix. We, we talk about a lot about the communist or socialists in Cuba, but we've really been living in the very strong state capitalists in the last 15 years. We really have been dealing uh, Practically, with a, we, we need a, a dollar so, uh, economy. We need a, a free currency uh, economy. And on the other side, ideological, and um, you know, in the, in the press, etc., we're still constructing a kind of socialist, communist in, imperial, that is no empire, that is not real anymore. No? And I think from that contradiction, I think my work grew up a lot in, in that... Uh, and uh, I think for that as well, I get very interested in, in the city. I've been really looking for the way to, to, to talk to people more directly. All these pieces that Corinna chose or from the very beginning of my work was really using photograph on the street, writing on, on the street. You know, a city was is really empty of uh, advertising, uh, et cetera. It's nothing. It's just like a virgin place. We only have these political statements on the billboards. And the nineties was very good for that, you know, to have the possibility to uh, still play a kind of social uh, relation with your work. And uh, on the other hand, we have a lot of discussion on how to enter this new uh, society that was arriving, supposed to be arriving to Cuba. And I think as well, the openness of the United States and the, I, I, talk, I say United States because it's a natural 
uh, market for Cuban art. I mean, we have a lot of people coming to Cuba by the time, a lot of museums. Many people really develop a career or part of a career in the relation with the United States. We do a lot in New York, Los Angeles, Florida. And not only me, a lot of artists. Now you can check as well on that. And then from that mixing, I think coming this, uh, uh, this possibility of doing a still a work that I, I even, if it's very concentrated in formal strategies, that I really take care a lot about that, is really always try to take the challenge of say something else, but beyond the work. And uh, I think for that reason, probably get more and more interest in architecture. I think it was a, a way that I really found in the, been doing for many years. I've been drawing in the 90s a lot of, but I, I call this world my, mm, before 2000, 2002, I call more like a, a, a naive architecture. We've been really looking at the architecture as a form, as a formal thing. But in the early 2000 that I get invited to documenta in Castle, I really get, decide to go in more uh, strong in my relation with architects. And I, for the first time, I started to invite architects and model makers to my studio. And, and that's, that's the, the, the way my work is, is today. I think it's a, uh, we've really been doing many things that I, I keep very important, uh, very big importance to the role of language, of how I've been using architecture uh, as, a, as a conceptual form more than, than a, a strategy to build. We've really been refusing a lot this idea of building. And uh, I, the first pieces I do very seriously in 2002, Korea referred to campus and some other pieces, well, it's really ready to, to build. We can do that in Havana. There are mm, different proposals I do in 2002, like a university campus. We do a, a, an apartment building, a, a medical a sp mm, a hospital, a small hospital. But we really deny to build. A lot of people been asking me, but this is um, been talking about utopias. Utopia is a word always coming to me and, and my work. And I say, yeah, I am not talking about utopia. I am talking about reality. And the reality could be solved in conceptual discussion as well. You know, we have. Uh, this possibility is not only like uh, we are doing paper architecture, it's really a real thing. And then from, from that moment, we arrive to this uh, project that we are doing in England as well, that I've been using a lot of methodologies I, I've been using in my, in my early wars in Havana. And uh, it's really this commitment to, uh, to, to, to art, to, to form, to, to, to social, uh, to society in general. And then I get invited to this country and to do an, an, an art piece, to do a public art piece. And the, the easy way to solve this is just do something, get the money and left. That is a great way to, to work and happen a lot today in, in the art world. But we really spend now like six years working in this little town, believing that the, what we are proposing there will be bigger than, 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 than what we should do in one or two months there. And that's all. I don't know uh, a lot, no? About me, you will be <laughs> decent today. Uh, finish. No, no slides. Do you want to keep this going, or you want to keep it going? Sure. Okay. So, Mark, thank you so much for agreeing to be here today with us. Mark Weston, AIA, is an assistant professor of architecture at the University of South Florida, where he teaches graduate courses in design, technology, and is currently charged with developing a state-of-the-art digital fabrication laboratory and its associated curriculum. His research focus is multidisciplinary, 
combining experimental building materials, digital fabrication, and physical computing with traditional notions of making in order to generate interactive and complex physical environments. Mark holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Architecture with distinction from the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. He's worked with Gary Partners, Ply Architecture, Bowen Architecture, and is currently principal of Maurer Western LLC or MW Labs. His work has been featured in publications including Metropolis Magazine, Environmental Building News, and Modern Steel Construction. Exhibitions of his electronic sculpture, Connecticut, Connecticut and interactive installations have been showcased in Michigan, Florida, and Germany. Please welcome Mark Weston. That's fine. Uh, I can honestly say I've never heard that said aloud. Really? It sounds, I got it it sounds right pretty good, website. I know. Um, thank you, Noel, for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, and uh, I'd also li like to thank the, uh, the student body of the art school for uh, managing to make me feel overdressed every time I come to one of your uh, events. Uh, I assure you, on my side of the quadrangle, it's quite the opposite. The fact that I don't own a single silk tie passes as tattoos in my world. <laughs> At any rate, um, um, I'd like to congratulate you and, and, and Carlos for putting together uh, a really successful exhibition, um, which has, has so much depth uh, in many ways. I'm able to read it um, both as, a, as an architect, as an artist, and as a student of language. Um, but uh, the, it, it possesses something, I think, that uh, I, I don't often see in architecture, which is um, an emotion, uh, a, a political awareness, and um, an attitude toward the making of things that in architecture we uh, you don't see quite as much because we typically talk about form, we talk about uh, making, we talk about materiality uh, at the expense of uh, metaphor, meaning, and politics often. So uh, I appreciate it for that. Um, and there, if you look at the, at the work uh, from, say, from my distance, uh, where um, on, on one hand it's a, it's a contemplation on, on, on things that are made. You, you have uh, um, compositions made out of graphical tape which are displayed on cutting boards with knives. Okay, this is, uh, this is a thing that is made in, in front of you, right? But it's also a statement on, on politics. Taking the, um, if you take the, the billboards, which formerly were used for political slogans, uh, now used to sort of express the, the anguish of a population uh, whose voice is sort of suppressed. I mean, there's a very, very powerful layer of meaning there. Um, and um, also as an architect, interested to see laid out, uh, say, this collection of buildings um, uh, cast in, in silver, which really are nobody's gems, right? Um, and if, if you know anything about the history of architecture, you know that uh, um, many, for example, Eastern Bloc countries have taken architectural style, taken uh, art movements, and used that energy to create an imagery for, for government, okay? Often, um, in, in many of the, the times that many of the buildings showcase were built, this is a modernist style, right? Well, it's very different in America uh, where almost without exception, all government buildings are made in a federalist style. And this is uh, a neoclassical thing. So think fluted columns, Greek, you know, uh, pediments and all this sort of thing. Uh, there's a, the, there's a, an attitude um, about uh, how one is seen I think that, that is different in this country than, than in many others. Um, and so when Carlos places uh, the, the Pentagon and Guantanamo Bay in this context, you see that the only American government buildings uh, rendered in a modernist hand are the ones that are meant to be invisible. Um, so this is not the face of government, this is, um, this is the face of subversion. Uh, so, um, there's there's much of that in Carlos's work. If you if you look at the the photographs where he has uh, rendered um, this sort of anguished words of, of you know, the people who are absent from the photographs with with pins and, and thread, 
you see uh, you know, floating in the air words that are waiting to be said, right? Uh, which which uh, are sort of half there rendered in the, in the signage and billboards of, of the, the city. Um, and then in the, uh, for example, the red paper folded uh, city that he's created, um, you, you can appreciate on one hand a uh, tectonic exercise where um, they're made from one piece of paper and they're, they're beautiful constructions. But in, on the other hand, he's, he's rendered them in red and he's depicting a city uh, which is built uh, instead of in an additive manner like, uh, like some of the other work, it's, this is a subtractive act. And so you're, you're made to think about um, you know, the city being built from someone's blood, perhaps. So um, I, I congratulate you, Carlos, for putting together something that is, uh, it's, like I said, it's emotional, political, and subversive all at the same time. Um, Um, Anything you would like him to consider? Yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, Carlos, when you, when you photograph the city, um, a, a city which is, which is full of people, right? Uh, at times um, when there's, there's no one there, um, what's, what's, what's the motivation there? It's terrible. We have to wake up very early. <laughs> That's the worst days in my life <laughs> when I have to photograph. Because uh, no, it's very difficult if you want to do. Uh, first of all, if you want to have a good light, and photograph, you have to go to certain hours. And it, I would say many things is formal. It's nothing to do with uh, no people or people. Sometimes. I have the problem that it's in, in Cuba it's a lot of bicycle people and I, I realize that in many of my photographs it's a guy with a bicycle and sometimes people will ask me why do you put always a guy in the bicycle? I say I cannot avoid a guy and then I don't know what is worse of not ha have anyone or have a guy with a bicycle there and then we're really looking for the building I'm looking for the time because it's important and at this time, we start to photograph in Havana around seven, try to do seven to eight sometimes. And uh, this is very hard because I have to wake up six, and then I have to be like a, uh, but it's really important to, because the, the light's really damaged. The light in Havana after nine, nine thirty is impossible. If you want to do color photograph, it's impossible. And if you do black and white, you have a lot of shadows as well. And then this is a, I am teaching a class of photograph here. But besides that, it's really worked very well to have a, a, many of my discussion in the, the 90s, 80s, 90s with uh, photographers. I grew up in, together with a lot of photographers. They really joined my work. That was very difficult because I was not a photographer. I came from the art world, and photographers hate artists. You know, it's something like a, they cannot deal with that. Only recently that we've been mixing that you can find more people do art or photograph, but this is a very recent uh, technology thing that's happened with the digital era. But before, the, to be a photographer is really have to be something very specific. And was very difficult imagining Havana develop films, have films, have paper. In the early 90s, it was a nightmare when I was a student. I get nothing of money and I have all my friends photographers who print for me and they really teach me and they, whenever I arrive with a bad negative, with a lot of light, they say, come and go early. Stop to do this to me because I don't print your photograph. And that's, uh, I realized that I, don't, I was not really interested in, photo in, in photograph of people, you know, it was a lot of photography of, of portraits in Havana. If you look for the history of Cuban photography, the history of revolution of photography is full of people. Even before, if you look for Walker Evans, in Havana, it's full of people, you know. But then if you see the Walker Evans photograph in America, it's full of architecture that is so beautiful. And I took that as a very good uh, example of what I want to do. I really wanted to concentrate in the empty place where I can play and I can put my, my own story, because it's a really fiction. I do a lot of narrative. When I do a photograph and I do a drawing, I just create in a screen. It's, it's a very writing thing. And I, I really don't need people there. Uh, 
Oh, that's Who interesting. Huh? Who was by? No, no. <laughs> thought provoking. I'm, I'm often criticizing uh, architecture students for not putting people in their in their renderings. Of course, we're doing these things for completely different reasons. Um, we're trying to, you know, basically sell buildings. Uh, but when I have a lot of people, eh? In this series here, probably no, but it's, we have a lot of bicycle people. Check, check. <laughs> it's a problem. It's really a problem. <laughs> Sometimes we need it for the scale as well, but basically not. Really, we will concentrate on By the way, sometimes I do photograph and it's not people, and when I've been doing drawings, I added some people in the drawing. Yeah. You know, I've been using this, this uh, architecture uh, touch. Sure. Um, does anybody here have any questions? We do. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Stand up and speak loud. Stand okay, and be I'm recognized. <laughs> um, my name is Leonette Vasquez, and I am uh, part of the Human Rights Association here with the USA. And I am a Cuban. I've been here for four years, so this is like, you know, very dear to me. Um, I wanted to ask you what is your goal? Like, what do you expect to accomplish? Art, art is really a big handicap in that. Unfortunately, art is a very specialist thing, and it's a very elitist thing. And that we probably have to blame ourselves for that, to be building a world of, uh, that really belongs to few people. And probably this uh, half an exhibition in the university campus is, a, is extremely good. Because it's a, you know, when you go to museums, you are on the hands of museums. When you go to a gallery, you are in the hands of the market and how this market works on your work. Here, at least, I think I can have a, an answer from people who are really studying and thinking. And I expect a lot from that. But I was a student as well, and I know that not every student are interested in art. And that's a very problematic thing as well. I think it's, a, it's many things to have to be working between, you know, the way art is or, or language work and the way it is deposited and, and passed to the others. You know, it's, it's something that is not in our hands many times. And that's the reason I've been avoiding, I, I really, I don't know, it's a long history, but I really, in between, if I really wanted to be an artist or I wanted to do another thing, of course I have to be an artist because I have, I don't know how to deal with other things. But it's really important, I think, the, 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 the equation, the education in between, you know, programs that really approach people to art. And uh, because already the language that we are dealing with, so we can say that it's so sophisticated, it's, it's out of a normal language we use every day. And, uh, and there is a problem already. And then how to, 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 to get this gap and, and finish this, you know? I think it's belong a lot to, to museums, to the programs in the middle. Now here, we've been talking a lot about this program that I feel so honored that they put it on the web with my work, etc. But it's also to make some other kind of discussion around that normally doesn't happen with art. With art. It's really, uh, you know, you see museums struggling to get people, to get visitors. And as well, we saw today that there's a lot of museums being built just for money for reasons to have a, a tourist discourse in the cities. You know, you go from Boston to Roma, then you have a Saha Hadi and, and Meron and Herson and the other, and it's, everything is about a big market around. And I am afraid that sometimes that what we are doing is really lose a lot of this possible touch. In the, in the Cuba thing was very interesting for me, this exhibition, really very, very interesting because I, I didn't show for many years there. And the museum was really a lot of people for the first time in around six years really find my work again. And, and was a lot of things coming from that. Corina probably can say more, but was a lot of visitors. We have the, the show for more than three months there. 
And, uh, but as well, I found this is the same problem, you know, you know. How many people really visit a museum to find uh, artist's work and have a proper discussion around that? I think this part is really out of our hands sometimes, you know. Or you do a more community uh, projects that has been happening a lot, been a lot of uh, discussion around that in, in the art as well, you know, about the relational art, and try to go beyond the, the the, the walls of the museum or the gallery. And then my goal is, uh, it's very difficult, you know, when you are dealing with language, you are dealing with something that's so specific there that you want to solve for you and that you are pretend that people will have from your eyes see something. And then in this point, in this tension, I, I hope to, to build something that at least stay a little bit in people's minds. You know? I hope that the I am not so sure like you, like uh, this should be a big hub. I don't believe in that a lot. Um, unfortunately, I'm more, uh, you know, I, I lose my faith in many things, but I have a faith in, in language as well a lot. I have a faith in, in the language as a communication bridge. I think we really have a way sometimes to do something like this. So specific for me, but as well can build a relation even in 10 people would be perfect. And then, you know, Julie? Hi, um, I'm curious if the meaning of the word changes for you in any way, maybe just subtly, uh, when you install the Cuba versus the United States or elsewhere. This is a very uh, particular situation, this exhibition. Uh, I do a lot of talk and a lot of uh, writing about the idea of context. I do believe a lot that the context of the, of the art is very important. It's not like you are in your studio and do things and bring it to everyone. And I've been very careful about that in many of my exhibitions, to try at least to make certain bridge. This is an exhibition that was already done, that I really developed for the Cuban audience, I have to say that. Uh, is a, for example, it's even a piece here that was not shown in Cuba, that was shown here, but was made for China, that in China have another completely big impact. And then, uh, how to say that when, when, when I do this show for Cuba, I really avoid to do a lot of the pieces I've been doing internationally, like uh, been working more in the architecture, uh, we can say international language or whatever. And I really concentrate in all this writing, in all these billboards. And uh, I do believe that language anyway has something there that could be universal. I do believe in that. I do believe a lot in the writing. And that's a lot there. I think people will get a lot from the writing. Even if it's another language, you have a translation. And that's make another, completely another bridge. But this exhibition, I have to say, that originally was built for a Cuban audience. Uh, the Cuban audience that have to look at the work I'm doing today. It's not, I am working really in many places. I am living in Spain now as well. I've been doing a lot in Europe here. And I think I, I, uh, in my work is already this happened, this evolution of being here and there that is uh, more in the global, if we can call that global uh, place. And, uh, but yes, probably it's a lot of handicaps to this work here, but uh, it it's a translation of a Cuban who live in abroad, who been in a lot in America, and try to communicate with people in Tampa that have a lot of Cuban relation background. I hope it's work. No, I don't know. I 
I don't understand every word, but everything you say, but uh, <laughs> it was complicated for me, this privilege thing. I, the, the architects really changed my, my, my way to, to see art. I really been doing this naive architecture for many years, and I've been invited to many shows about cities, and, and my architect's friend all, always told me, please keep like this, you are so naive, that is good. <laughs> and then I followed that advice, you know, don't draw, don't draw very well, keep it like this, don't do so perfect. But then we realized in 2000 that I need, I have a lot of people say, why do you don't use AutoCAD and this program? I say, no, I like to draw by hand. And I, we've been doing that, I was crazy. And then in 2002, I have to do this project that was a major project for me. They want to invite me to, to, to show at Documenta in Castle all these drawings I've been doing about Havana. And I was already thinking in, in another level, I say, for the first time, I've been doing some models already in paper, uh, uh, wax, etc. And for the first time I say, no, I really wanted to do a, a model. I wanted to think the city as the way I am really an architect and I can change the, the, the the way that things are happening. And I approached, the, the project was very beautiful because I get to the to the Havana, all the unfinished building from the socialist time, that was no money anymore in the 90s, and was these ruins, but was ruins that never exist. They never happened as a building, it was pre-building. And then we researched all the, the, the drawings, the original drawings from the architects, and then I invited an architect and the model maker, I say, okay, this is the reality, this is what we have. This is what's supposed to happen, but we, we want to keep the what we have here, these ruins, and from there we continue with something new. And then this something new will be our individuality, but in the real way we will make this happen. And we really see them build, we, we build already well. When I say I build, it's because I know that's a building. You know, it's nothing else I need to prove that it's possible to live in that building. And that was a project for the first time, it was very, a strong position as a we are not arch I am not architect, but I can I can deal with that form, I can deal with the functionality of the space. And that moment I really changed a lot of my, my, my relation with art because it's really give me the necessity to be attached to a reality, to follow certain rules and to really don't don't be so free because I think art and I will always keep it as an artist, I follow the advice of architectures, so free. In so free in the way I use material, the way I think in the space, etc. But really give me something new, give me. In one hand, working with the, with a team. I, I know by myself, I have six people work with me all the time. And since 2001, we have an architect and a model maker in the team, plus a designer, plus art historian, writers. We are a group of people who really sometimes look for their pieces like a more probably like an architecture. Uh, Team, no, and then this project came in England, came in around 2005. It was really like a, you are so interested in architecture, you are love so much the city. Came here and do something for the city. That's the way artists are invited. You know, we are like a, so glamorous. We get there, we build bronze pieces, etc. And I hate that. I hate the fact that I have to find a lot of bad pieces on the street all the time, all, all over the world. You have this bronze that is terrible. You have to deal with the stones, and it's nothing contextualized. And I am very into this. I think it's important that even if you would put a box there, please give a context to that. Work with the context. Work a little bit with people. And that's happened with this building. You know, we get there, and I'm supposed to do a sculpture, and I turn to another way, saying, no, I wanted to do a library. I wanted to research the situation here and came out with this building. The building was not because I want to build. I want to build there an idea that I think is functional for the for the city, is functional for the people. They they really like it, they accept it. The politicians give the money. They accept it now. We are in a very good moment. No? I don't know how I will have to deal with that. You know <laughs> we have an architect that is a young architect coming from out from the school and is working with us since that. And uh, always we say, okay, if we really have to do that, we will fund, fund it another studio. It's nothing to do with us. You will deal with that and just go and probably have to go to England because in Cuba we cannot deal with the problem 
of construction in England. And then we have, of course, we have partners in England. We have people who are the partners of the project, etc. If this happened, it would be like a, I have to say that I will be outside checking things, deciding the, um, the visual. I decide a lot in the visual, in the form of the things and the functions I want, but I really base a lot in the architects. I don't do myself. I think it's, it's not always such a privilege to be an architect. <laughs> but uh, I've heard it said that the difference between sculpture and architecture has to do with stairs and bathrooms. That's, that's, that's one way of saying that uh, someone would come to me and say, build this, whereas someone would come to Carlos and say, build something. Designers, the building is so complex for us. You can see it in the internet. In my website, the only thing is this building. You have rendering some videos and stuff like that. And then we really sit there and was so complex. Now we already are, we was out of technology to do it. And then because we have to develop everything from 3D and the animation from 3D and the construction, even the models are being very complex to do these models. And uh, now we are not, we are, on, I, I say, I have to be sincere, we are in, on cap about to do this. As we exist as a, as a group, we cannot do it, but we already, I have to say that we have it already. You know, for me, architecture is, is a, this, this is a decision as well. If you do something that you make function there, and we make a function, we are clear of the space of measurement of, of technical things. We are there already. And then if something happened after that, I know it would be a lot of contractor on construction and engineering that probably would be terribly boring. I don't want to be there. <laughs> Question from the back? Yes, ma'am. I do present my work uh, sometimes there. I am very close of your artists. I follow <coughs> what happening, and inside and outside a lot. Uh, as an architect, uh, if you ask me as an architect, then I am not. But as an architect, uh, I think that I've been talking a few days ago with an architect uh, from here that is very involved in Cuba. I think Cuba is a is a is a jewel that is nothing happened there and for architects would be a perfect place, you know, it's like a version. And I think will be a lot of roles of artists and thinkers and good politicians and people with money, everything would be so important as, you know, to, to, to play this role on the future of what will happen in Cuba in urban terms. And uh, I probably will be there I wanted to be there, not to construct anything. I don't have this ego. I think I am very happy doing paper buildings. But I think it's very important the, 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 to understand that the, that the, uh, uh, the city, the urban situation of any city is so important. It's so important to people. I think it's what we have, what we, what we decide in the next few years about Havana, about any city in Cuba would be so important for the future of this country that I really wanted to be there. And uh, that's probably will bring a big political role because I think it's not only about aesthetic things that we have to discuss there. And I hope it's people really open to do that. I am afraid, I am not afraid that what people told me, ah, oh, you are not afraid when Americans arrive to Cuba and change everything. I say, you know, Americans will arrive to Cuba if we want. What really will come into Cuba is a lot of money. And this money is, is good. And it's dangerous on the other hand, because you know the, we will have a lot of fat, fast food architecture. You know, we will have a lot of architecture done by this just to make money and live. That will happen for sure. And then it's, it's now is a very beautiful treasure. We have an old city, 
that is very decayed, but is so beautiful, is so complex, is so big, that only in urbanism we can spend years and years to repair that. And only with that we will have a beautiful place. Then after, of course, we have to do a new infrastructure. We need to work in the in the contemporary city. We don't have a contemporary city. Or, or contemporary cities from the 50s, that is very beautiful, but it's only for the 50s. Then, you know, it's a lot of things coming from there. And I am not involved. I think a lot of architects and people from the academy in Cuba pay attention to my work a long time ago from the architect side, because we've been already working there, etc. But it's really something new that should happen. And in this moment, we'll see what happens. Sure. Imagine inside my building selling coffee. <laughs> inside my sculpture, it's so strange. <laughs> no, I think, of course, we, we think a lot on that, you know. And I didn't have the the chance really to to face that. We are facing with this project that uh, we spent a lot of years. We really we were so exquisite to try to do this well that we that past the moment that we have the possible the possibility of a lot of money to do it. Because when they invite me, it took so long time to develop. Because I say, I don't want to run tomorrow to do that. And then the crisis, the economic crisis arrived, and in England being hard to construction. And recently, we presented the project last year. It was very far of the first moment. And we've been waiting for them. You know, we are really in the hands. In this time, we are in the hands of politicians there. They, they approve the. They give us a space, they say, okay, we are right, but now we are in the hands of money. And that will, will be the first uh, situation. We've been thinking how to deal with the building, if we wanted to be involved with that, because I, I offer different fortunes to the place. And already, for example, we, have, we need people who run the place to, to make the service in the way they want. We have a cafeteria or a restaurant inside. We have different things that have nothing to do with, with me. And, uh, you know, I never faced that really, uh, 100%. Uh, and in, in my art, I feel, I really feel very free. I do really things that I really wanted to do. And uh, that's probably would be my next master, to go to architectural school and try to deal with that. Uh, I think the only thing we will build will be that. I don't think I will never go back to this. I don't know. I never say never, but... Uh, you know, even people ask me all the time, when, when Cuba start to build and things, what, what is your plan? Do you plan to be there? And I say, no, I am not. I wanted to be really out of this situation. I think, for me, architecture works a lot as a tool of a very conceptual way to discuss about reality, about the environment. And uh, I hope, I, it's a lot of things going on there as well. I am interested in, you know, uh, thinking a lot in, in ecology, and we are talking a lot about well, sustain, 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 sustain. sustainability, that is a discussion a lot in architecture, and I love this discussion going on, because probably I will have a better Havana than the one I should have 10 years ago, because now it's really a big topic that we really need to construct with another mentality. And uh, I think my role there will be like, a, like I am, and I, I feel like I have something to say in terms of language, or or uh, political position in terms, not in politics only, in terms of an individual. I am an individual that have an opinion of things, and I hope to get this uh, possibility to discuss that. And uh, or we have, we do a few things already, and we have some experience as an artist, as a visual artist, as a thinker. 
So, we, anybody have any burning questions? We'll go ahead and wrap up today. Um, I hope to see you all tonight at the opening, uh, 7 to 9 at the Contemporary Art Museum. Again, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for your rapt attention. And thank you, Carlos, Corina, and, and uh, Mark. Thank you.